Hello and welcome back to everybody. Um, I think people are still rejoining us from their, their breakout rooms. Um, I love that Barbara loved her group. I feel like if the conversation in my breakout group is any indication, um, there were some really fruitful and interesting conversations happening. Um, so let's, let's get into the meat of tonight's conversation. Um, just a reminder that we are all going to be muted through this conversation with the exception of uh, Nicole and Abby. Uh, if you have questions, if you have thoughts that you want to share, please put them into the chat box uh, throughout the conversation. I will be keeping an eye on that and we'll be sharing the questions uh, towards the end. Um, okay, so Abby, Nicole, does the word God get in the way? Hi, Nicole. Hi. Uh, I first of all, I want to just give a big shout out to my group. We had the best group, I think. Um, but it was I disagree. On a, on a very serious note, um, we can't just be competitive, Nicole. We can't. We have to exhibit something more godly right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but on a serious note, it, just, it, it already pushed me personally to have the four others um, saying what they believed. And I don't want to share it with you, but I'll bring some of it up later. I do want to just start with kind of that big frame of, um, I think personally for you is the word God in the way, but also as a rabbi talking to a lot of Jews who struggle with uh, divinity, do you see the, the hurdle that I see a lot and what a lot of rabbis report to me, you know, what is in the way? Like, why is this, is this actual, this terminology such a roadblock, do you think? Mm, um, so yes, it gets in the way. Um, I think because we have an idea, particularly in the culture that we live in, of a certain idea of, you know, what I sort of call the Santa Claus God of, you know, there's a God up there keeping a naughty list and a nice list and who can zap people and, and what, you know, thinking, breathing person wants to believe in that God, right? Um, and I think we get frozen in our thinking about what God is when we're kids. And then when we're adults, we say, well, I don't believe in that. Um, but if you ask, you know, pretty much any member of the clergy, I think they would say, well, I don't believe in that God either, right? And so um, I was just saying to the folks in my group, I think there's a, I think, it's brilliant that our tradition gives God a name that is unpronounceable, this four letter uh, name of God that we can never pronounce, but that somehow has something to do with the idea of being or becoming. Um, because that starts us off as saying, yeah, you know, it really is, um, it is not that set in stone um, image that you have and uh, it's much more fluid. I think most, I think many rabbis I know, the closest that they might get to a sort of common understanding is in Star Wars, if you think about the force, right? Like that's the idea of God for so many rabbis, I think, is like, there's the force and the force is strong with you. And how do you tap into the force, right? And that's, it's a pop culture thing, but I would say that's probably closer than the guy in the sky for most of us. And actually that resonates. Um, there were a couple people in our group who talked about energy. God is energy. Um, but what is it for you? If someone said to you, or I am asking you now, what is God for you? How would you answer that? Mm. Um, I, th I think about my experience of God, um, rather than defining God exactly. Um, I can say that in my experience, there is a source of, um, love and creation that is bigger than me that I am sometimes able to be more present to than others. Um, and that doesn't feel like it originates with me. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I think the first time I really understood this was I was um, in chaplaincy training and I was talking with someone who uh, had dementia and we were having a very circular conversation. Um, and this person was very concerned that they were doing it wrong. Am I doing it wrong? Am I okay? Am I, am I okay? Am I doing it right? And I found out of my mouth, 
the phrase, God loves you exactly the way you are, coming out out of nowhere, right? That wasn't my theology at that point. Um, but when I reflected on it, I thought it's true, right? There is enough love in the universe to hold this person exactly as she is and to love her for exactly who she is. And then comes the tough part, which is believing that that could be true about yourself, right? If I can believe that about someone else, can I believe that there is also enough love, um, unconditional love in the world that I am also loved in that way? Um, and of course I resisted and my wise uh, rabbi who I was working at the time and said, said, oh really, you're so special. You're so special and unique that you're the only one in the universe that God doesn't love? I don't think so, right? Um, so for me, it's a lot about love. You have said to me, we were talking um, before this, just how much that, that uh, training, that chaplaincy training and working with those patients really shaped your theology. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Like why, in a way, was your kind of approach, even to Judaism, forged in the crucible of that, of that work? Well, I think I have, I had um, always approached the idea of God very intellectually. Um, you know, I had always been someone who was really interested in philosophy. Um, and I think I was, it was all in my head. And it wasn't until, and, and I had this conflict, right? Even when I went to rabbinical school, some of my friends who I had been in law school with said, well, but do you actually believe in God? And I sort of hemmed and hawed and was like, well, I believe in, you know, the force that calls us to be our best selves or whatever it was, but it was a very like John Rawls idea of God. Um, and so it wasn't really until I had the experience of sitting with people one-on-one um, -on -one and having a feeling that I can only describe as like this exhale, like suddenly everything dropped down time got weird um, and there was this sort of intense focus where I felt a deep connection and I felt like I was um, I was included in a flow of energy that did not originate with me um, and so I had to go and I think you know, Rabbi Bookdahl in a video series we did several years ago, you know, talked about when is God. I had to go with that sort of like, oh, I'm having this experience. What does that tell me about God? Right. And so um, there's a great book by uh, Rabbi Danya Rutenberg called Surprised by God, where uh, she also talks about being really resistant to the idea of God, but having all of these experiences with, you know, looking up in the night sky and marveling at the stars and trying to square that with her atheism and being surprised that she actually felt connected to something else. You know, I, so much of this comes down to the anthropomorphic God that people just can't get their, they can't accept, you know, that God is essentially, you know, whether it's the, the guy on the cloud in the sky that's, you know, pointing down and judging. Um, and I understand those roadblocks, I have them too, but one of the things I pushed uh, Rabbi Geller on, and I want to push you, is our liturgy is, is kind of putting that back on the table over and over again. And we're about to go into a holiday that does that, you know, with, in neon bright lights. Even let's just take the Unatana Tokev, the, the who, who will live and who will die prayer. It's very hard to sit in synagogue or we will be sitting in our virtual synagogues in our homes and read that, that text and not feel like we are actually, it's actually, there's a verdict that's going to be rendered about our behavior in our lives, depending on what we did and whether we met a certain bar. So are you saying we shouldn't actually believe the words that are on the page? I think the words that are on the page are a record of how our ancestors experienced God in the time and place that they were writing those words. Right. And so if you're living in a monarchy where you have relatively little power, then maybe the best metaphor for God is, you know, the king who has ultimate power over you. When we're no longer living in that setting, you know, a king may not actually have the same resonance uh, for us. Um, 
I think it's I think it's too bad that so many Jews only come to synagogue on the high holidays because I feel like the high holidays that really is you know a predominant image in the high holiday liturgy in a way that there's a lot more freedom in the you know the weekly liturgy for different ideas of God of you know the God that makes the sun come up in the morning, the God that, you know, brings dew onto the grass, a lot of things that folks could probably relate to a lot more easily, but, um, but there is a majesty about the high holidays. Um, and a lot of our liturgy was also created in a crucible of, you know, uh, crusades and persecution and, uh, you know, the Una Tana Tokef, um, coming out of a place of, you know, who will live and who will die. I think you have to sort of think about where it came from. And it's really powerful because the whole thing about the high holidays is saying, yeah, you know what? We don't know. We're mortal. And so if we're mortal, how are we going to live our lives? And there's something really powerful about that. I don't know that you need to um, believe in the guy in the sky in order to like stand Maybe, you know, the image of you open the ark and maybe it's a giant mirror, right? To stand in front of that giant mirror and really examine, am I living the life that I want my obituary to, uh, to talk about? Um, and that's where I think, that's, that's where I think Yom Kippur wants to put us. Um, but if we, get, if we get caught up on the king, then, uh, then we miss out. So let's talk about the king, the, 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 the kind of the, the mother of all king language, which is a Vinu Malkano, it's a high point for many of us, I think, um, in the service, musically, it's, you know, it feels like, you know, one of the, the apexes of emotional moments. But those two words are very uh, difficult for people. The first of all, the king language that you address, but also the male language. But then the rest of, of, the, of the words are kind of exquisite and I think really speak to us in this time. Can you just talk about that particular liturgy and how you, you think we should be thinking about it now? Yeah. yeah um, so I would actually love, um, uh, Sarah, if you could share the poem uh, that I brought. I ran into this poem on a, a Facebook group today, and I had forgotten it existed. And so I wanted to share it with you guys. Um, so this is a Short Amidah by Sid Lieberman. They say we're supposed to be in a palace, so we bow and take certain steps as the prescribed supplication from our lips. But do we really know of castles and kings? My kitchen faucet constantly leaks and the kids' faces usually need cleaning. If a door opened to a real palace, I'd probably forget. Um, uh, I'd probably forget and carry in a load of groceries no, the door we stand in front of when the Amidah begins is silence. And when we open it and step through, we arrive in our hearts. Mine's not a fancy place, no jewels, no throne, certainly not fit for a king. But in that small chamber, for just a few moments on Sabbath, God and I can roll up our sleeves, put some schnapps out on the table, sit down together and finally talk. That's palace enough for me. Um, mm, that's so great. thank you. Um, so I think- Why do you like that? I like that because for me, it speaks a little bit to the gendered piece of, of Vinu Malkinu, I think. If I think about, um, I had real resistance to the idea, the idea of Avinu, like God as father, and it may be because I came from you know, in my childhood, a sort of patriarchal Christian tradition where that had a certain valence. Um, but being a mother has completely changed my idea of what it could be to have God as parent, right? Um, if, if I think about when I had my babies and they were screaming and miserable and all I could do was rock them and say, it's going to be okay. And that was like as much a prayer for myself as it was reassurance for them, right? <laughs> like, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And just the idea that 
I could be held by something like that, that there could be a source of unconditional love in the universe that would hold me when I'm broken and crying and help me understand that there was, I could, I didn't have to do it all myself, that there was something else that could hold me is beautiful. And, you know, so for me to be able to say, okay, you know, as a lifelong feminist, the idea of like father and king are not going to be my way to access. Well, what is it to stand in relationship to a loving parent who wants us to be our best selves, right? And who wants to help us grow into our best selves. And sometimes, you know, we see in, um, in Ahava Rabbah and Ahavat Olan, the, the prayers right before the Shema, right? How does God express God's love? In Torah, right? God gives us instructions. And any of us who are parents are like, yeah, sometimes love looks like bedtime and teeth brushing and a lot of things, you know, it's not always fuzzy. And so there's something about that poem that I think allows for real life and allows for like a, the feeling that you might find God in the respite that comes in the only five minutes in the day that you have to yourself. Um, and that maybe that's the only time you get to connect to that still small voice inside and that that can be beautiful. Mm. So you mentioned that you were raised Christian and I know uh, probably everyone on this call knows that Mm -hmm. um, you made you made that crossing of the Red Sea, um, but just can you, you talk about just did you feel that you were choosing Judaism, in a sense? Like it's when we talked, it, it you know before this, it feels like your your thinking, your theology has evolved through rabbinical school, through obviously your rabbinate, but just at the start, did you feel like you were kind of choosing to kind of. I guess, even pray to some, to a different God? Mm. Well, I, so my, my specific background is that as a child, I, um, I went to a fundamentalist evangelical church, um, and the theology there was definitely one of, you know, folks who don't go to our church will burn an eternal hellfire, which even as a child, I looked around at my friends at school who were good people, and I thought, well, that doesn't make any sense. Like what kind of God would, you know, punish them for not going to my church? It didn't, it didn't compute. Um, but I loved the music and I loved the community and I loved the feeling of really being part of a community. And so I became sort of a seeker. Um, and, you know, I tried to be Unitarian, but there wasn't, they weren't demanding enough in terms of what they wanted me to believe. Um, and I tried a bunch of other things and then I lucked out and met this great Jewish guy who it felt like gave me permission to, um, to, to find Judaism. And I started reading and fell in love. And I think one of the things that made me fall in love with Judaism was that instead of having a sort of carrot and stick theology of you know, either you do the right thing and then you're going to get this great reward after you die or you're going to do the wrong thing and you'll be punished after you die. It was sort of like, well, we don't really know what's going to happen after we die. So like, let's be mentions now, right? Like, let's live a good life now. Um, and that seemed a lot more appealing and realistic to me. Um, and so I think that's one of the reasons why the Unatana Tokef and the other high holiday liturgy can be a little challenging because it seems a lot closer to that sort of carrot and stick uh, theology that, you know, I, I realized was not for me in the first place. And can I ask, was there a, a sense of um, finding home or do you feel like you created your own spiritual home? Oh, I, I feel like a hundred percent I found home. Um, I fell in love with the holidays, actually. I thought the high holidays were the most brilliant thing ever, right? Okay. It was, um, the idea that you would actually set aside time to really consider how you've been living your life and to, um, to decide how you wanted to continue living your life and that, that that could be the most sacred thing, right? That the most sacred thing wasn't like, 
the big celebration, the most sacred thing was the really like sitting and doing the hard work of being a, a good person in the world um, felt really important. And, uh, and it was, you know, there's a lot of fanfare, but ultimately it, it comes down to you looking in the mirror. And I think that that felt really uh, beautiful to me. You gave me a book when I was working on my holidays um, research, my deep dive into every Jewish holiday. You gave me the Alan Liu book and he's sadly gone, but it's called, This is Real and You Are Totally Unprepared. Is that the right title? Completely um, unprepared, yes. You are completely unprepared. And you know what I loved about the book in addition to the fact that he's so blunt is that the stakes felt so high for these holidays in his frame. Like, wake up you cannot just sit there and pound your chest during the vidui like this you're on the line the this and, and i feel like this year like we don't need any metaphors it, it's the stakes feel extremely high it feels like that book has kind of been reified but it's hard to feel those stakes without god being involved in it for me and i guess i want to ask you like where is god in the urgency and frankly the fear i don't i don't mean fear of like we're gonna die but like why why does this matter why does this matter unless god is kind of in the equation here hmm. that's a good question abby um well i was talking with a friend who i'm doing some studying with and we had been given this prompt about you know can we can we live more like today might be your last day on earth, right? We have these Jewish texts that say, repent one day before you die. And the, the trick of that, of course, is that you don't, you never know what day you're gonna die. Um, By the way, just, there's a country music song, Live Like You Were Dying. I know that's, that's very, you know, that, that's not, that, that's bringing it down to a really kind mm -hmm. of mundane level. So I'm sorry for interrupting. I love country music, so that's fine. Um, I, um, you know, and I said, well, that's not quite right, because if I knew that this were really the last day, right, I might sit and eat chocolate the entire time. Like that is, it's actually, you know, what if you had one to five years left, right, where there was still time to do something in the world that you felt like would leave the world a better place, or to change the way that people might talk about you when you were gone, or to give, you know, to give something. Um, to, to make your story worth telling. Um, and so that, that feels much more powerful than what if you were going to die tomorrow? Because if you were going to die tomorrow, you know, you, you might live a, a very hedonist last day and that's not how we want to go through our lives. But I think there's power in knowing that we're mortal, whether or not you think there's a God. Um, I think for me, the um, maybe the call for, okay, then what, right? Okay, then what? Well, our tradition tells us, you know, that we need to be agents of love and justice in the world and compassion, right? And so how am I answering that call? Right. Um, in for those of us who are doing the shofar project with IJS right now, there was this idea uh, talking about the the text that we read from Isaiah on Yom Kippur of you know cry out with the call of the shofar. How do you allow yourself to be a conduit for that call for justice? Um, so I think it's um, and I think you and I talked a little bit about this when we first spoke. You asked me like, why is God important? Uh, in this equation in, you know, and for me, it allows me to act lovingly toward people who I have no personal experience with that leads me to love them in particular, right? Um, particularly people who are my political opponents, who I disagree with on a lot of things, right? If I don't have a back, if I don't have a backstory with someone that would lead me to love them specifically, it allows me to accept that there is 
enough love in the universe to hold this person and their story and their brokenness and that maybe I need to make a little bit more room to be part of that love and compassion. Um, and so it allows me to, to rely on something other than myself because if I just rely on myself, right? I can be selfish. I can like, you know, I'm not always, I'm not always the best. You're always the best. Well, thank um, I want to I want to go to questions in a minute, so I hope you'll all start putting them in the chat uh, for Sarah Berman. But I guess I want to pick up on your idea of being responsible or or loving towards others. You know, often the you know Betzalel Elohim language. I think for I'll speak for myself. It sometimes can almost lose its meaning. It's said so often, and it's really hard to just love a stranger or someone you really disagree with. One of the images that. Uh, Rabbi Laura Geller gave that she actually got from uh, Sylvia Borstein, I think at IJS, um, the, uh, the Institute of Jewish Spirituality, was this idea of, of all of us being on a plane when, it, there's, when we're going through turbulence. She said, it's, it's like when you're in that moment, and this is very familiar to me and rings true, you kind of are connected all of a sudden to everyone on that plane, you're, and you kind of love them. Like, we're all scared together, going through this together, and there's no difference between us. It doesn't matter what we come from. It doesn't matter what our heritage is or what our differences are. We're in the same boat or same plane together with the same fate and the same fear. Um, that, you know, when, when all of the sort of differences wash away. And, and, you know, that's one metaphor. But I'd love you to pick it up because I think this idea of oneness and connectedness is often, it's, I don't know, slippery as an idea. Or I'll speak for myself. Great. Um... I, I told one of my kids uh, the other day that, you know, I was going to go meditate. And uh, she was like, are you going to achieve enlightenment? And I was like, I, I doubt it, but I'm going to go have 10 minutes to myself. Um, right. Um, but I think, I think that, I think that the airplane is a beautiful example. Another one I think about a lot is, you know, if you've ever been a parent on a playground, and someone of someone else's kid falls and you don't see you know the parent right there and like all of a sudden you're like okay i'm gonna go check out that skin knee right i'm part of a community that is beholden to each other um and i think um i think there are some times when i can access that sense of like being part of a cosmic oneness um but most for me, it's much easier to access if I really slow myself down and say, you know, this person was a baby once. This person, right? This person had this life story. And, um, you know, no one loves to live their life in a miserable fashion. So what could it be that's going on? Oh, they're afraid. I've been afraid. I can connect over the idea of fear. How can, now that we're, now that we realize we're both afraid, where can we go together? And how can I be part of this? Um, but yeah, I mean, I think for me, abstract never quite um, works as well as something that feels a little bit more intimate and relational. Great. Sarah, do you want to throw in some questions? And I certainly have more. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have two questions right now. Um, the first comes from Harriet, uh, who is both noticing and asking, um, doesn't God become anthropomorphic or doesn't God get kind of reduced to anthropomorphism because our scriptures humanize God by saying things like God spoke to Moses or God you know, Moses saw God's back or God and Moses spoke face to face or mouth to mouth. Um, isn't that kind of constriction of God happening in our scriptures? Yeah, 100%, right? Um, which again, if you think about um, our Torah as a record of how our people has experienced God over time, um, you know, and we only, I guess it's like trying to imagine, right, that there could be other colors that we don't see. And it's really hard to figure out, well, what color would that be? Because we can't think about it. Um, and so the only way, the only things that we can use to get a handle on what our experiences are, are come out of our experiences being human beings living in 3D, 
um, you know, and moving about the world. And so we describe, you know, the majesty of God that we see at the Grand Canyon as being a sovereign or, you know, I don't know. Um, also, I don't know. Um, I don't think we experience a lot of prophecy in our time, but I think we do have people that we look at and say, wow, that person um, was really tapped into, uh, you know, something remarkable. I'm thinking about, uh, you know, how the late John Lewis, uh, you know, some of the words he spoke and thinking like, oh, you know, so I don't, the answer is yes, it's in our, it's in our Torah. And I don't think that has to be the last word of how we understand God in our time if it doesn't work for us. Now Abby's going to tell me that I'm fired and um, am a heretic. <laughs> not, not today. I'm not going to tell you that today. Um, Sarah, another one? Yeah. Um, the next question is from Sarah. It's from me. Is... We focused on how our understanding of God is constricted by language tonight, but in what ways might language expand our understanding of God or deepen our relationship with God? Mm. Well, Sarah, uh, when we were preparing for today, I shared with you this huge list of different metaphors and ideas for God um, that we have in our tradition, right? Um, and you know, in thinking about, okay, well, we have Psalms that talk about God as do, right? And what does that mean? Well, that means, like, it's ultimate grace. Do is the water that even though the air is so dry that it can't sustain, uh, that it's never going to rain, there's still water there that is just enough to sustain life, right? And so, like that idea of like, yeah, God is like the do, even when you're running on empty, um, somehow there's, there's just enough. Um, or the idea of a rock, right? I, I actually really relate to this idea of God as a rock, um, both because I think there's something about feeling like you're being held up by something that is strong and enduring and realizing that rock also, you know, isn't static. It's just, there's a really long timeline for rock <laughs> that eventually the rock also changes, even if it seems eternal. Um, and so I think I actually really love the Psalms for all of these metaphors because it helps you play with this idea of like, oh, well, if God is like a rock, what does that say about God? And how might I experience that in my life? Um. So Steve is wondering if, if God becomes too abstract, so abstract that we really lose the idea of God, um, do we just become moral, moral atheists and not Jews? Um, so I think there's two questions in here. One, when God becomes so abstract, do we lose a sense of God? And second, without a sense of God, are we Jews any longer? Mm. Well, I think there's a long uh, and storied history of Jewish, Jewish atheists. So the answer is you still get to be Jewish, uh, even if you're an atheist. Um, uh, I think too much abstraction is where I started in my theology, right? It was this idea of... Um, you know, I think you see this somewhat in Reconstructionist theology of like God is the force that makes for salvation kind of idea, which again is, is sort of philosophical. Um, and so I guess what I'm arguing for here is actually the other way around. Like rather than starting off with here is an idea, now force yourself to believe it, right? Start with your experience of the world. Where do you feel a sense of sacred connection, right? What are the moments when you feel a sense of sacred connection? And what does that actually tell you about the way that you might be connected to the force that created the universe, a, 
you know, a people, a history, something else, um, start, start with what you know, because then you don't have a leap of faith in believing in it, right? I think, I, I think Abby, when in our first conversation asked me, are you a believer? And I, I was like, well, I, I believe in my own experience. So yes, <laughs> right? I experience, I believe that I have experienced the stuff I have experienced in the world. Um, so do you just become moral, uh, you know, moral atheist? Maybe it's still good to be a moral atheist. Um, it's better than being an immoral atheist. Um, but I don't know. For me, it's it's uh, it's more personal. Um, and and the other, uh, I see Debbie Palmer yeah. is also asking yeah. a really good question. She asks, "Do we all need to experience God to know that God exists?" If we accept that the Torah is a book of stories that we can uh, have meaning and relate to, isn't God in Torah also part of the story to allow us to see God or find God where each of us chooses? Um, what do you think, Abby? No, that's not fair. <laughs> You're the rabbi. I, I don't think I can answer that question. I mean, I think um, it relates to Stephen's question of um, then what makes us Jews, right? What makes us Jews is that we have inherited a beautiful, rich textual tradition that has grappled with what it is to be a human being and find meaning in our lives and has offered a certain path or you know, framework for creating a meaningful connected life that will um, give us moments of sacred beauty in it. Um, and so there is beautiful power in, in staying connected to that tradition um, because it's time tested, right? Like how many times are you like, oh, we live in these busy lives and how are we gonna do it? And you're like, wait, there's an app for that in Judaism, it's called Shabbat, right? Like there's a wisdom here. We've been figuring this out for a long time. Um, I guess I don't, I don't know for me what it would mean to know that God exists if I didn't have a personal experience that caused me to believe that that was true. It would be, um, that would be a real leap of faith, right? If I, if I didn't have a personal experience that led me to think it was true. But I, I accept that for other people, it may be very different. I may just be wired the way I'm wired. Um, Jan Klein um, asked, do you think that our individual concept of God is a projection of our experience and desire for relationship, which I think is a very um, perceptive question that, you know, when I, I talked to um, Yehuda Kurtzer, who's not a rabbi, but you know, is the president of Shalom Hartman. And he was saying that everyone's prism is so much about their experience. You know, like how they come at God is so much about what they bring, what they sort of want. Mm -hmm. um, so does that resonate with you? Yeah, I think, Right, just, just as, you know, some people may have projected a need for a king that could be in charge of everything because life felt really um, unstable and uncertain um, or for, you know, a sort of patriarch who was gonna tell them what to do because it feels good to know what to do. Right, like maybe I'm projecting my own desire for um, unconditional love and compassion on the universe. That is totally possible. Um, and I think that um, it's hard to know and we're limited by being human beings who have brains and emotions and the way that our brains and emotions work. And I still think that striving for connection makes us better people than if we are not striving for connection. So even if we're making it all up, it leads us to a place that I think is a place of greater wholeness and healing and 
ultimate truth to the no, to the extent we can know ultimate truth than if we just threw up our hands and said, you know what, we're all in it for ourselves. Um, it's me against the world. Like, I think it's a more meaningful way to live your life. And so if we're making it up, you know, that's okay too. I love that. And I, I just want to say, Sarah, I just want to, again, we're moderators prerogative because I know we're at the end, but one of the things that Nicole, you said when we were talking before, you said, if you pray, maybe you can have community that will hold you and you won't feel so alone. And I, I feel like, you know, first of all, these Zoom conversations have just been a snapshot of how Central keeps us from that loneliness, that there really is practically, and I think I would argue, relationally and spiritually, we show up for each other. Um, but I think, Nicole, that you give us, you often invite us into the hardest conversations by making us feel that kind of what you were describing, like it's all fair game, right? Our doubts are fair game. We all stay in this because we feel something powerful, whether it's God or not. Um, so I guess I wanna give you the last word to kind of just say, you know, especially as Reformed Jews, we, ha we give a lot of rope, but there is some way that we also demand something of each other. And whether you call that, you know, God operating or not, you know, what, what, how would you put words to kind of that idea, that, that impulse, that feeling that many of us have that we, we, we want to show up for each other and we actually should, we need to show up for each other. Well, we're all we have, right? Um, I always tell this story about during Hurricane Sandy when my, um, my daughter asked us why we were bringing garbage bags and giving them to the rabbi at Road of Sholem where we were members at the time. And I said, well, because God can't buy garbage bags, right? Like, <laughs> We're in it together, guys. This is a group project, like it or not. Like as someone who didn't like group projects as a kid, right? Because um, <laughs> you always feel like you're doing more work than everyone else, and you know what? And that's like life is a group project. This is this is what we have. Um, but I think you know if we bring it back to the high holiday liturgy, which I think has been a frame for a lot of these conversations, right? Um, there's this idea of on Rosh Hashanah, it is written. On Yom Kippur, it is sealed. But if we do uh, teshuva, right, like repentance, if we, um, if we pray, if we give tzedakah, we can temper the severity of the decree, right? And the, the carrot and stick guy in the sky vision of that is, well, if I, you know, rack up more good deeds on the nice list, um, then maybe um, I don't die in the next year. And I don't think any of us actually believes that. And it's okay to not believe that. Um, but I don't think that those words are false, right? I think that if we repair our relationships so that when something terrible happens, we have people who are there to catch us. And if we build a spiritual practice that is sustaining and can help us be more resilient, um, and if we invest in our community in a way that you know creates a safety net for everyone, then it turns out that the severity of the decree, when something bad happens, we're gonna experience it differently. The decree may not change, but we may experience it differently. And I think we only get that by, uh, by doing the work and, uh, you know, and realizing that we're in it together. We yeah. are. Thank you, Rabbi Nicole Auerbach. Thank you, Rabbi Sarah Berman, everyone for being here. Wishing you such a sweet new year um, in the midst of so much suffering and sadness and uh, discombobulation. Um, I, I'm so glad we're gonna be together somehow, at least virtually, and uh, have some really good challah and dip it in honey. Yes, also apples. Also apples. All apples right. are fine. I prefer the bread. Okay, Nicole. I like, uh, lots of love. I prefer lots. the carbs. Yes, me too. <laughs> All right. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody.